Father. Abba, Father. We thank you that you indeed are our Father. And that, Lord, uh, just as we saw in that video, and, and we see all the things that earthly fathers do and, and all the things they try to be for their children, uh, we know that you are the most magnificent Father of all and that your character and nature far exceeds our own. And we are grateful that you have loved us so much that you sent your son, your only son, Jesus, to suffer and die on a cross that we might be adopted into your family and be forever your children. So, Father, we do say happy Father's Day to you, and we thank you that, that you are present with us this morning, and may we glorify you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to continue our study in the Lord's Prayer. And, um, but before we do that, I want to let you know that you can, during the service, access the PowerPoint slides that I'll be presenting. You can access them on your phone. What you would do is go to www.thehomechurch.org slash teachings. You would click on this Sunday's teaching. You see it there on the right. There's a sample of what it would look like. And so you click on this Sunday teaching notes and then you can access the slides as you wish during the service but also during the week if you would like to do that the scripture that we are using uh, it comes from Matthew 6 and I'm going to be reading this from the NIV and as we learned last week this is Jesus who is speaking and he's speaking to his disciples and he says but when you pray go into your room Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And this is the word of the Lord. As we think about prayer we, and we think about the Our Father, many of us have grown up and are familiar with that prayer. Many of us have recited that prayer. But what Jesus is saying here is he's giving us a model for prayer. He's given us a structure for our prayers. And he is making it clear that there is a difference uh, between those that are pagans, he says, and how they pray, and the way that the rest of us who are children should pray. And we'll get into that. But today, the uh, subtitle of our message is, But If Not... But if not, and I want you to consider this, um, if you, uh, you may have seen the movie Dunkirk, you may be familiar with it historically, but if you re recall in 1940, the Allied troops were stuck on Dunkirk. There were over 350,000 Allied troops who were completely uh, abandoned and stuck. They could not flee, and they were faced with complete surrender or fighting unto their death. And they, the British naval commander sent a telegram to London. And the telegram consisted of three words. But if not. Many of you may know and understand the context of that, but many of you may not. 
But at that time in 1940, there was no doubt what the British commander meant by stating, but if not. What he was referring to was Daniel chapter 3 in the Old Testament. And if you remember this story, it's a tremendous story. If you haven't read it, read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three godly men. And this is what Daniel 3 says. Well, let me give you a little background first. King Nebuchadnezzar was an evil king. He had made up an idol of himself. And he was requiring that everybody in the land bow down to that idol. And he was demanding that they do that. And if not, they would be cast into the fiery furnace. And when he found out that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not bowing down to that idol, he was upset. And so he had them brought to him immediately. And he told them, he said to them, Now if you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And then he says, And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up but if not so when the british commander sent this telegram what he was saying was that god may deliver us and a miracle will be required but we will never surrender we will never give up even if we are not delivered. We will stand and fight. And we know that they, in fact, received a miracle that when the people of England determined that they needed help, they went out in their dinghies and their small boats and they rescued over 330,000 men. It was a miracle. The reason why I'm subtitling this message, but if not, is because we're going to be looking at that portion of the Lord's Prayer where he... Jesus says to pray this way, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This was the prayer of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Deliver us from this evil king, O God. Deliver us from his hand. But what did they say to the king? Our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we will not bow down. We will not surrender. As we look at this, what we will be looking at is that Jesus is, is, is calling his people to understand that we will all face temptation, that we will all face tests and suffering and trials. That he's calling us to pray that we would not be led into temptation, that we would not be essentially devoured by it. The word temptation could be translated, the Greek word temptation, could be translated as either test or trap. And so what we're saying is, and what he's calling us to pray, is that as his children, that we know that we will be tempted, that we will experience trials and suffering in our lives. And what we're asking is, God, do not let us be devoured by them. And, but if temptation must come, if suffering must come, will deliver us from the evil one. And what we'll see is that what he's saying is, is that the worst part of the temptation is not the temptation itself. It's not the circumstance or the suffering. 
It's how we respond to it. And will we respond as Jesus would have us respond? And in which case, we will be delivered from the evil of sin, which is responding in a way contrary to the way Jesus would have us respond. So the prayer is, deliver me from responding in an evil way and help me to be successful and respond in the appropriate way. Way One of uh, Tim Keller, as he preaches on this, you may know Tim Keller, but he talks about how um, there, it's so important we recognize that the circumstance can be seen as a test or a trap, and it just depends on how you respond to it and how well you're prepared for it. And he tells the story of how when he was in seminary, he had a professor, and the professor said to him, uh, and said to the class, look, at this material is so important, and it's important that you Learn it uh, incrementally, and I know how you are, that many of you will cram and study the night before the test, and in, in that case, you will not learn the material. So what he said was, I am not going to tell you when I'm going to give you a test. So throughout the entire semester, you will not know when the test is coming. It may come any day. So he gave pop exams and surprise uh, quizzes. And so everybody, if they, had, if they wanted to, to do well, they had to be prepared every day. And so for those who were prepared, when the test came, it was a good thing. It said, show, look at how much I know. I'm learning. I'm doing well. I did well on the test. So in that circumstance, the test was a good thing. But for those who were not prepared, the test was a trap. Because the trap, then actually they fell into the trap and they weren't prepared and they failed that. So the question that, we're, that is, is asked of us today is how do we look at the circumstances of life that will come? And will we be prepared for them as we move forward? There was a man who was arrested um, and he was sitting in jail for uh, a very, very long time, been sentenced to um, a long time, several years in prison. He had been interviewed uh, because what had happened was uh, when he was a younger man, he had been driving his vehicle at night, and he hit a child. And when he hit that child, the child was seriously injured. But rather than get out of his car and help the child, he drove off. He immediately left, and he hid. And he hoped that he would never be found, but he was found. And it, it was determined that this child would have survived if that child had received immediate attention. But because nobody knew of the child's injury and he didn't stop and help, the child ended up dying. He was prosecuted, justly so. He was prosecuted and was serving now uh, many years in prison. And he had been interviewed, and he essentially said, this is why I reacted that way. When I was a child, he said, that, um, that my dad had this beautiful watch in his dresser drawer. And I would go and look at it all the time. And one time, I pulled out that watch, and I started to examine it. And as I was examining it, I dropped it, and it shattered. I picked it up, put it together as much as I could, put it back in the drawer, and then went away. The next day, my father gathered all the children together and said, who broke the watch? And he said, I didn't answer that. I didn't um, admit to it, and uh, nothing happened to me. And I learned a lesson that day. I learned that if I don't acknowledge when I've done wrong, that, that good things will happen to me better than if I did. And so I began to respond to difficult things in my life by escaping them, by not admitting them, by running from them. And he said, so that when the big test came, when that big test came, when I hit that young child, I just did what I had become accustomed to and used to, and I failed that big test because I had failed the little test along the way. And so as, as Christians, we recognize that our Father in heaven will is a good, good Father. We are called to pray to him as Father, and that we are to recognize that he will allow these circumstances and temptations in our lives in order that we might grow up into maturity, into becoming the children of God in a mature fashion as he's called us to be. As we consider how to be delivered from the tests in life, I'd like us to consider that there are four ways in which we can address the test. One is to expect them. One is to say, I recognize that these 
things that happen in life are expected, that I shouldn't be surprised when they come, that um, I should expect them to be presented to me, and the question is how I will respond to them. There are little tests that happen all the time, and those little tests, sometimes we see them as irritations, but they are, in fact, tests. And those, as husband and wives, we know, we see that all the time. How do I respond to um, a husband who is maybe not being very mindful of my needs? Do I respond in an irritated fashion, or might I respond as God calls me to respond, still selflessly and lovingly? How do I respond to a boss who treats me badly, a boss who maybe ignores me? Do I respond in kind, or do I respond in a considerate and loving way? Those those are things that depend on how we handle them, then we mature or we don't as a result of those tests. And those are the little tests in life. And they prepare us for the big ones. Because the big ones will come. And many of us have experienced big tests and big things that happen. In uh, 1 Peter 4, Peter says, and Peter was one of the apostles, and he writes this. He says to the believers, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. What Peter is saying in that context is he's saying that don't be surprised if these fiery trials come because they will come. And don't don't consider that to be a strange circumstance, but actually expect it. And so when we're looking at life and we're looking at the the big trials that come, the question is, how are we going to, to handle them? And many times... What we do is we respond to these trials in in different ways. Sometimes we look at them and we get angry at the fact that something uh, bad is happening to us. And we're saying, I don't deserve that. I basically, my life was, I've been living like I shouldn't, so I don't deserve that. And we get angry in response to that trial. Another way is that we feel guilty. And we begin to think that, well, maybe I deserve these circumstances because of the way in which I've lived. But another way may be that we feel that we get hardened toward it. We, we get hardened toward life and we say life is just, is just uh, bad and is going to be bad for me. But then there is the right way to respond to that. And there is the way that Christ calls us to respond to it and teaches us to respond to it. And that is to say that we respond and we say, I acknowledge that I have a loving Father in heaven. And that my relationship with God is that of father and child. And that my father is all loving and all caring. And if he allows these circumstances, then it must be for my good. And we look to him and we ask this omnipotent good father to lead us through this difficult time. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. We know that even Jesus himself, the beloved son, only son of God, was led into temptation, wasn't he? He was led immediately after he was baptized. It says the Holy Spirit came upon him and led him into the wilderness. And there he was tempted. So he, by his own father, was led into temptation. And we also know that 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 occurrence happened before he taught us how to pray. And then we know that he was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what did he say there? He said to the Father, he said, Father, please remove this cup from me, as he knew he was about to suffer and die. But if not, even Jesus said, but if not, you have the power to remove this from me. But I will surrender to your will. Your will be done, not mine. And we know what happened. That Jesus himself then went to the cross on our behalf. And that God, his Father, allowed that to happen, that we all might be redeemed and come into that relationship with God the Father. We know that we are told in 1 John that it's through Jesus' death on that cross that we have become children of God. And it's through his work on the cross that has caused us to become children. So that very act, 
that we would consider to be a horrible act, that no one of us would ever wish on anybody. This was God's will. He allowed that to happen, that we might be saved and become children of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what God said about Jesus, and yet he allowed these things to happen to him. And in John 17, we learn that Jesus prayed, and in his prayer, he prays and he says, Father, I in them and you in me, that they may become, and he's referring to us, and this is Jesus praying, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus is referring to the fact that here, that God, you love them even as you have loved me. That is mind-boggling. That the God of the universe loves his children who have been adopted into his family as much as he loves Jesus. So this is known as the the doctrine of adoption. And uh, think about adoption for a minute. When we think, when we know uh, that a child is adopted, that child is, has a child done anything to become a member of the family? No, the father has adopted the child. And the father wants the child to become like the family, but when the child is first adopted, that child is not anything like the family, and the child can't, it begins the relationship, maybe still living in an unruly way. But it's over time that the child becomes more and more like the father and more and more like the family. But it's all the father's doing in the adoption process. So the essential act is the act of adoption. That is the critical, most important act because that changes the nature and the character of the relationship. Well, that's what God the Father has done for you and I. Through the act of his son Jesus for those who have trusted in him. That he says that it's because we trust in Jesus that we are now adopted children of the Father. And as adopted children of the Father, then we have a relationship with him that's so different from the rest of the world. And we recognize that he loves us enough as his children that he wants to teach us. I mean, I I don't know about you, but um, I'm I'm sure many of you have experienced lessons that your father has taught you. Lessons that your father has allowed you to learn for your good that at the time may have not been... um, the best for you. I know as a father, there were many times that we had to discipline our children. We had to actually deny them something that they really liked. And one of my sons, and I won't say which, there were three of them, but there was one instance when one of my sons really wanted to attend a party. And we wanted him to attend that party, but something had happened and we said, no, you can't go to that party. And it was the hardest thing because my son was just crying out, I want to go. Said, no, you can't go. We stood firm. No, you can't go. And my wife and I went in the other room and cried because we wanted that for him, but we recognized the greater lesson. The greater goal was to really learn something, and so we had to deny him what he wanted. We know that a good, good father, and Jesus says, pray our father in heaven. We know that a good, good father knows what is best for us, And that when we know as Christians, when we ask him, lead us not into temptation. Don't don't bring the circumstance that's going to cause me to be tempted to do evil. Don't allow that to happen. But we trust him. And we know he's such a good father that if he allows these circumstances to happen, then we know it's for our good. And that's how Christians are different from the world. If you have, we recognize that our relationships have a basis to them. Every relationship does, has a certain basis, which determines the level of the exchange that can happen. For instance, if you have a boarder who's renting, well, that boarder is renting from the landlord, and that relationship is a business mechanical one. It's a business relationship. I pay the rent, and therefore I get the apartment. And the landlord says that uh, this is what I expect of you, is that I expect you to take care of the apartment and pay the rent. 
So there's this relationship, right, that's based on a business transaction. What I, based on what I do, I get something in return. And that's how Jesus is saying when he's referring to those who are babbling and they're praying. And pagans, he's talking about religious people because they're praying with their many words. And he's saying to his followers, don't pray that way. Don't pray that in such a way that you think that's based on your many words that you will be heard. And what he's saying is that there's a difference in the relationship, that the relationship that they have is not the one of, of a father and son like you have, or father and daughter. Their relationship is different. So just like a boarder who maybe doesn't get what they are asking for in prayer, that they're praying to God and they see their relationship is based on the mechanical, I did good, I did what I should have done, I went to church, I spent some time fasting, I did these things, but my prayers weren't answered. And then they get angry with God. And they say, hey, what happened? I deserve this. And you see, that is more of a business type relationship. It's, I did this, you have to do this for me. Whereas Jesus is saying, we have a family relationship with God. That we don't demand anything from him. That we go to him when we recognize, we, we call to him for help. But when he doesn't give us the help that we're looking for, we're like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we say, you have the ability, God, to deliver me from this. You have the ability to work a miracle in my life to deliver me from these circumstances. But if not, if not, if I have to go through this, then I know that you will deliver me from it, that you will deliver me from evil, that you will help me to respond in the right way. And that's what Jesus is saying. We have to pray every day. We have to pray that these circumstances, that we will respond to them in a way that will not lead us to evil or sinning, but that we will, in fact, successfully respond in the manner in which he's called us to respond. So that, that test, that we'll pass that test, and it won't be a trap for us. So we have to expect that these trials and sufferings will come. We must also recognize that the evil is not the circumstance itself, but the evil that he's referring to is how we respond to it. And that we were saying that, that we understand that the, the situation is for our own good, as a loving father will allow that. And, and oftentimes we recognize that, as Jesus says, that he the, he says that we are to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. And that term can be, can be translated as evil or evil one, but it's the same thing. The evil would be sin, that which is not good, which comes from the evil one, or the evil one himself who's leading us into temptation, but both are the same, deliver us from sin, deliver us from this act of doing evil. And what, so it is the, not the pain, but it is how we respond to this circumstance that would be the evil that we're asking him to deliver us from. So I want you to think of, for just a minute, think of some of the things in life that actually the circumstances produce a better result. Like if you think of diamonds, you think of coal and how the, how that coal is, um, buried beneath tons of rock, and during, because of that pressure, that coal ultimately becomes a diamond. Or, or in a fire that becomes bright, beautiful gold. These, this is the way God has designed the world. And for us as believers, how we respond to that determines what, we will, what will be produced in us in the end. And if you respond, for instance, to a situation that requires you to respond with selflessness, if you respond with selfishness, that you will not be turned into a diamond, but possibly powder. Because what happens is now you're saying, I can't handle this, and I give up. And I, I react in a human um, way. You react in a way that is ungodly. Well, then you have not 
benefited from that pressure as God has called you to. So we expect these trials will come. We, we, we ask that he would help us not respond in a sinful way or an evil way. The third is that we must process this test through the love of the Father. And that's when we think about this. If we process this through the love of the Father and we recognize that our Father is with us and that he does not abandon us or leave us and that we are the adopted child of the Father, then we recognize that he is doing what is best for us and we ask him and we ask him to help us through these circumstances. The fourth way to get through these difficult times is to watch how Jesus and look at how our Savior actually handled temptation. And I want us to go back to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I didn't complete the story. I ended it with when I told you the first time that they said, our God will deliver us, O king. But if not, we will not bow down to you. And so we know the story that what happened was King Nebuchadnezzar became so upset that he took them, bound them, all three of them, and had them cast into the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace was, was so hot that it, it killed the soldiers who actually threw them into the furnace. So these three men were thrown into the furnace to be burned to death. When it says that Nebuchadnezzar then saw from a distance, and what did he see? He saw a fourth man in the furnace, and that the three of them were walking in the fire with a fourth man. And Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we throw three into the fire? Why is there a fourth? And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, goes out to the, in front of the furnace, and he demands that they come out of the furnace, that they come out of the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of there. And they walked out of this fiery furnace, and it says that they were not, their hair was not singed, there was no smoke on their, or the smell of smoke on their body. Nothing happened to them. Their God did deliver them. But they were willing to go into the furnace because they knew that that's then their God, the character of their God wouldn't change whether he answered their prayer or not. And they were willing to do what was right and suffer the consequences. And in that case, Jesus was with them in the furnace. Think of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, God, deliver me from this. Take this from me. Take this cup from me, the cup that you're asking me to drink, which is the cup of sin, the sin of man that I have to drink. Take it from me, he says. But if not, Jesus himself said, but if not, I will go into the furnace for them. I will go into the furnace for them. And he did. He went to the cross for you and me. That we might be called children of God. If you are struggling with your little furnace, because every struggle that we face is a little furnace compared to the struggle that Jesus faced. I want you to know that he is with you in that furnace. He may not deliver you from it like he didn't deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you can be assured as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God, that your father knows when you are weeping. Your father sees it. As a good father, I don't wish evil upon my children. And I am nowhere compared to God's goodness. He's omnipotent. He sees and hears your tears. And remember that in the midst of your furnace, Jesus is with you. You are not alone. He is walking in that furnace with you. 
and his Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego exited from that furnace. And they were so much better off as a result. The king himself then declared that everybody would bow down to their God. God worked a miracle, didn't he? Well, the miracle that we are called to pray for is that Jesus would be with us when we go through the furnaces of life and the difficulties. And that we would, he would walk with us through them. And that we would hold his hand. And as we're holding his hand, that we say, would you help me respond in the way I, that I should? Help me not to give up. Help me not to quit. Help me to respond as you've called me to respond. And when we do, that temptation, that test will be a test and not a trap. Because you will then see that you have changed. That you, in fact, have passed the test with his help and you are different. So we pray, lead us not into temptation. But if we must go, then deliver us from evil. And help us to respond as you called us to respond. We have a good, good Father. And this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, begins with a prayer to our Father. Today, again, is Father's Day. And we, as children of God, we recognize who our Father is and that we have a good Father to whom we should pray. And Jesus is telling us, pray this prayer every day. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a structure for prayer. Praise him. He's worthy to be praised. That's what the word hollow means, to revere him, to praise him. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are king. Let your ways reign in my life. Give me my daily bread. As we are praying for our daily bread, we're asking him to please give us what we need on a daily basis. So he's calling us to pray daily for our needs. To forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Forgiveness is critical. We know that our relationship with the Father is because of forgiveness. Because we have been forgiven. And because we have been forgiven, he calls us to forgive others. I want to give you an opportunity today as you think about this and you say... Do I have that relationship? Can I be assured that I have that relationship with the Father? And I, we're going to go into communion, so I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come on up. And we are preparing for communion. First John 3, 1 John 3.1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's an amazing truth that we should be called children of God. But we know that every human born is born in sin and has sinned. And as a result of that, they are separated from the Father and are not children of God. But the Bible makes it clear to us, and Jesus tells us, that if we repent of our sins and say, and we trust in Jesus and his work on the cross, that then we are adopted children of the Father. And that's what Jesus is saying. This, my adopted children, this is how you are to pray. So this Lord's Prayer is for those that call themselves believers and in fact are. Let's pray. And as we go into communion, I just want you to know the communion table is uh, uh, it's the Lord's Supper. And what we do is we come and we remember his death on the cross and his sacrifice for us. The bread represents his broken body that was broken for us. The juice rec represents the blood that was shed for our sins and cleansed us. The communion table is for believers, it's for those who actually follow Jesus. And if you would not consider yourself a follower of Jesus, then don't take communion today. But if you are wanting that relationship and want to be assured that you are a child of the Father. Well, today you, that you can be assured of that by accepting and trusting in the work of His Son on the cross for you. You trust in Him and say, I believe in you. 
Help my unbelief if I don't believe, but I want to believe. Help me. I want to be a child of you, my dear Father. I trust your son's work on the cross for me, and today I follow you. Well, if you say that today and you mean it in your heart, then you are a child of the living God, and you can take communion. And that's our prayer for you. So at any time, you can come up during the next two songs and then take the elements back to your seat. Take some time with the Lord and, uh, and spend some time with Him and then just take the elements as you see fit.